Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, again, my name is Matt. I'm Jessica. Uh, and we're here to talk about testing and whether or not your tests suck. And if it does, what you can do about it. Um, so, you know, testing is a big subject uh, and there's a lot of facets that we can cover. But I think we've all probably seen the memes around this, right? The, I don't always test my code, but when I do, it's in production. You know, testing is for the weak. Uh, my left bicep is the best testing that's available out there. Um, I, I want to kind of get beyond that a little bit. You know, there, there's different types of ways that you can verify your code. And, you know, people have talked about the testing pyramid, the testing trophy, um, you know, whatever shape your tests look like. Um, I think there's value in that, and we want to find ways to make that better. So the you know the Simon Wilson had a really good uh, quote that said, "The more experience that I get building software, the more I believe there's nothing that slows me down more than not having a quick way to confirm if everything's working or not." And I think that we've all kind of been there, you know, especially in the JavaScript world. If you take a project off the shelf, maybe something that you had been working on a year or two ago and you pull it down, you run NPM, and you just cross your fingers, NPM install, and you just cross your fingers that everything is going to work the way that you want. Um, and that really does kind of slow you down. And, and I think that one of the best ways to make sure that something is consistently working is to have automated tests that verify that the parts of your application that are important continue to work and not have to do that manual check over and over again. And I think the unit tests are a really great way to so how do you actually know if, you know, if your tests are valuable and good? Um, well, step number one is, do they exist, right? If, if you don't have a uh, unit test in your project, then it's pretty, you know, the, I guess that's the question for the philosophers, is if you don't have tests, can they suck? Um, <laughs> but, but you need to have something in place, right? And, and there's plenty of tools in that space that can help out, um, you know, but, but you need to make sure they're around. And do they pass, right? There, there's been plenty of projects that I've you know, opened up and run NPM test on, and you know, 300 ran, 300 failed. It's like, oh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> uh, so, like, th there's those are some baseline, just ground level pieces that I think just good project hygiene, good testing can help get you in that position. So, you know, the the first step doesn't matter which tools you have. There's plenty of testing frameworks at this point in JavaScript's uh, you know, maturity that can help get you in that position. Um, so I don't, I don't care which one you use. Um, you know, in my projects throughout the years, I've jumped from, I think JS, or yeah, JS Unit uh, was the first <laughs> testing tool that I used. Um, but I have a lot of experience using Jasmine, Mocha. I've uh, done a little bit of Jess, and lately I've been pretty enamored with Utest. Um, it's really built around you know, ES modules, runs really fast, um, and like in general, you can just get a really good feedback loop in place. But whatever it is, like I'm, I'm agnostic. You can, you know, we're, we're a big tent in, in this community, and so just write some tests and get them, you know, get them passing. Um, putting continuous integration around them, like there's plenty of ways that you can level up in that world. But uh, but no matter what it is, you can you, know, uh, you can. Make sure that whenever you are uh, making a change to your code, that you run your tests and that they pass. Mm -hmm. GitHub Actions, there's plenty of ways that you can make that function. Very good. We can also just run them on demand whenever we want to. Like, for example, if, you're, if your husband has written a project and thinks that he has good testing for that project, maybe, maybe his wife will run those tests and see how good they actually are. Oh boy. While I pull this, while I pull this up, Matt, would you like to tell folks a little bit about your Arnold C project that I'm about to put to the test? It it wouldn't be one of my uh, presentations without talking about the best program language of all time, uh, which is the Arnold C language. Uh, this is the, the programming language that uh, is was originally built uh, to run on JVM. So we don't have any tests on here, um, but all of the keywords are based around uh, uh, catchphrases from different Arnold Schwarzenegger program or. Uh, so if you want to increment a number, then you have to type up, get up, <laughs> number, it's get down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the end of every statement uh, is you have been terminated. It, like, it's great. Uh, there's syntax highlighting as a VS Code plugin now. So, yeah, like, that's, that's yeah there sure is. The, the 
<laughs> I, I am waiting for the White House to send out a notification that all programs should be written in RLC. Uh, that hasn't quite well, happened yet. Well, be before we can get there, let's let's make sure that this wonderful and very important library is adequately tested. Yeah. So this. So, yeah, so this will take your RLC program and run it in, or convert it into JavaScript. So it's a compiler or transpiler mm -hmm. all the language you're writing. Yep, and I see, Matt, that you have some nice little examples here of what things look like in Arnold C and the corresponding code in JavaScript. And I'm hoping that if I run the npm run test command, you have that set up and working and that we'll see some passing tests. It's the moment of truth. 27 passing tests! That's awesome! You have tests? All right. They're passing? Okay. That's great, all right. I guess presentation over. Well, let's, let's look at some of these tests. So you've got a nice little helper function to do the comparisons. You've got arithmetic tests, checking that a variable is declared, an integer is printed. Okay, this looks like a good list of tests. Oh, you have branch statement tests. Um, Matt? <laughs> Where, where are the tests? <laughs> Maybe feature test? No. Uh-uh. Oh, boy. Uh, input test. Surely that? No. You're just supposed to look at the file name. Not uh, the how about logical? It'd be logical that there'll be tests in the logical. No. OK. Well, uh, Matt, I have, I have a gift for you that I think might be applicable to this situation. <laughs> So we, we've probably been on some of these projects where you know you might have testing theater in place where you know in order to meet a requirement from you know uh, uh, to to get your CI to turn green like maybe you have some tests but they just assert that true is equal to true or something that isn't like actually adding a whole lot of value right that but but it makes it look like you're doing testing um, and you know some. Sometimes uh, working on a project is kind of like that, that you, know, you, you go in with the best expectations, you kind of trust that your teammates are working on the things that you want, um, but sometimes you just need some cold, hard, objective metrics to see whether or not you're achieving your goals and to tell your, you know, your teammates that the practices they're doing kind of suck and how to get better. I think we're talking about team members, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So what tool, so I don't know, do we have tools that can kind of help out with that? Well, the good news, Matt, is that we absolutely do. But let's talk a little bit first about um, why, why these, these tests, even though they exist and they pass, why, why, why do those, why do they suck, Matt? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons why you might have low quality tests. Um, if your tests are like not running against the parts of the code base that are actually in use or that have complicated logic, then you know you may be testing the non-hot paths of your code. Like that's probably not adding a whole lot of value. Um, or like I think the the bigger issue is if you don't have faith that when you make a change to your code that you should also be updating your tests to reflect that. Right? If there's a break between the you know how you work with your with your code. If you were to say just delete an entire method and none of your tests uh, failed, then that's probably an indication that that part of the code isn't tested effectively enough. Um, you know, Kent Beck probably said it best that like the heuristic that he uses is that I write tests until the fear of my code is transformed into boredom. And it's at that point that you can really say that, like, you know, you may have seen code coverage or other metrics to try and guess that. Those really don't get, or, they may not get exactly to, the, to the, the value. You kind of have to go based on vibes. Um, but I, f I feel like we can probably do better. You're right, we can do better. There is a tool that we're going to talk about tonight called Striker that tells you if your tests are doing a good job of being tests. So you don't have to just rely on your vibes and your, your good feels, Matt. You can go to strikermutator.io and follow the very quick and easy installation steps get Striker running on your code base. It is great for JavaScript. It supports a few other lesser languages as well. And it supports all of those testing frameworks that we mentioned before. So let's talk a little bit about what Striker is and what it does. You're testing your tests with mutation testing. Well, what is mutation testing? Mutation testing is an automated process that does what Matt just described. It goes and modifies your code 
then it runs your test against that modified code, and it expects a test to fail. Because if your code changes and a test does not fail, that means no tests were testing that code that you just changed. So you'll hear terms like mutant or mutation. Those are those changes that it does to the code to simulate the bugs. You will hear survived. That means that no test failed when that mutation was applied, and that's bad. Survival is bad. We want to kill things. We want to kill all mutants. So it's good when you see that word killed. That means that at least one test failed when that bug was introduced, when that mutation was applied. And so that indicates that you do have adequate testing for that particular chunk of code that has the killed keyword associated with it. So survival is bad, killing things is good. That's the most important takeaway here. What are the types of examples of mutations that Stryker might do to your code base? Uh, it can modify your um, comparison function, so it might change a less than to a greater than. It can completely remove data from objects and from strings and make sure that, some, that things still pass. It can replace uh, methods with just a, a no-op, doing nothing, making sure you're, you're testing that method. It does, it does all kinds of, of different modifications. And we can even run it against your wonderful Arnold C code to see where there might be some gaps in your testing. So I've already installed Stryker on this project. There's a lovely Stryker config file that has everything set up. It's using Mocha, which is the framework that Matt used to write his tests. And when I run Stryker, which I've already done, it generates a nice little uh, report that will tell us how well Matt did on writing his tests. So if I go to the main page here of all files, it says, oh, hold on. I think I have to, yeah. So it says it's at 32.48%. That, how does, how does that sound to you, Matt? Is that good? 32% is pretty good for a batting average. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, think, I, think we can, I think we can do better than that. So if we go and look at our, at our striker report, we can see what lines of code are killed. Remember, that's good. If I turn this on, you can see them highlighted in green. We can see which survive, which again is bad. And we could see which are not even tested by anything at all. No coverage. That's even, that's even worse. So we can see that Matt has done a pretty good job with assignments and int declarations. Not a lot of things to highlight there. But as we get further down to our if expressions, nope, nothing. No test whatsoever. Else, nope. While, wow, nope. So Stryker is showing us there's some opportunity for improvement. Well, the first thing I am going to do is the, the first thing that showed up there is lots of lots of orange flags was the um, the if statements. So I am going to add some tests that will take care of those if statements. The first thing I do in my process is I want to make it easier to write more tests because we don't write tests oftentimes because it's, it's hard to write them. Fortunately, Matt already made a helper function to help us in writing our tests, so I simply pulled it out into a util file so that it can be used by these other test cases. And then I go ahead and write my first test, an if statement test. Now our lovely branches file is not empty. It has a test in it. Look at that, Matt. It's amazing. And I follow the same patterns that Matt had already established. He had his Arnold C code and his corresponding JavaScript code following all the same conventions that he had in place. I very much appreciate that. Thank you, Matt. And how much, how much do you think this will improve things? We were at, we were at 32.48, just writing this one test. It's probably at 100% now. Well, that's, that's awfully ambitious. I, I think you need a little lesson on if statements and while statements are different, and there's other things that need to be tested. But it does give us a pretty good improvement, 41.88.
So even just writing a single additional test can have a huge impact on the quality of your testing and the confidence that that can give you in your code. Well, now that we've, now that we've tested the, the if case, I think the next, the next logical step is to do the else case. Here's the, the else scenario, as you can see. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't apply, very appropriate. That makes sense. Let's see how our tests have improved from 41.88 to 46.15. Excellent, very good. Well, I've done if and I've done else. How about an if else? That seems like the next logical step to me. If, else, if, else. Okay, let's run that and see what we got. Oh, it, it didn't change. Well, it turns out that in Arnold C, there is no distinct else if keyword. It's just else and if. So adding this additional test, it clearly added no value, right, Matt? I mean, it's a good indication of how Arnold C works. So even just as documentation, I would probably keep it around. It takes, you know, it runs fast. And if the spec ever were to change, we'd be ready for it. That's a very good point, Matt. I like that. I will keep it around. Keep your eye on the Arnold C mailing list. Yes. <laughs> well, now that I now that I have some good coverage for this this if scenario, I want to understand a little bit more of some of these some of these things that are surviving. I noticed that even in your assignment expression, which you have 27 tests for, there's this chunk of code here that has lots of lots of survival, lots of mutations. It just changed the if to true and nothing failed. It changed it to false and nothing failed. What's, what's going on here, Matt? What is this? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, some of, a lot of that ops node stuff is for generating source maps that you can translate your, uh, your Arnold C code into JavaScript and max, max between the two. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder if there's a way for us to test that, to test source maps. Mm, that's, that's complicated, but we'll give it a shot. All right, so I have modified my util method so that now it is actually pulling in the source maps. This used to say two string, now it says two string with source maps, and I'm at least pulling them in. Let's see if that makes any, any difference in this code. No, no difference, okay, that's fine. Let's try actually testing something about our source maps. Let's check to see that they actually exist. That's, that's a good thing to check, right? Yes, come on, better, be no. Still, still no improvement. Maybe, maybe it's not enough that they simply exist. Maybe we need to get into a little bit more detail. So now I'm actually parsing the source map and, and making sure that the content of the source map matches with the, with, the, with the JavaScript. So let's see if that improves anything. Oh, marginal improvement. 54 to 55. Um, I do see if I go back to all files, our transpiler is now 100% covered. There's your 100%. All right. So that's good. Get the emoji ready. I'll, get, I'll, I'll be honest, Matt. This source map stuff is complicated. Do you think there's value in continuing to, to go down this rabbit hole of trying to test source maps? Yeah, I mean, we're using a library from Mozilla to generate those. I mm. have pretty good confidence that it's been pretty well tested. So maybe not. Maybe there's other parts of the code that we've written or that I've written that would be a better value. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Just because it's not tested doesn't mean that it needs to be tested. The important thing is that we're reflecting on what's tested and what isn't and making conscious decisions about where the risk is and where we want to add those tests. So let's look at some of these other things that are currently surviving, surviving our mutations. Well, the first one I see is this var. You're just talking about var and how awesome it is. You didn't test var? I, sorry. What are, you, what are you doing? So if it replaces var with an empty string, it, the code still, all the tests still pass. So what's going on here? Well, I found by looking through the scenarios that Matt had outlined, that in every single case where he says he's testing arithmetic, he is declaring a declarate or declaring a variable on one line and assigning it to the expression on another line. Nowhere is he testing where he both declares it and assigns it to the mathematical expression on the same line. That is something he has not tested. 
So I'm going to add a test case for that and see what happens. Now, now we've got the declaration and the mathematical expression on the same line. And if I refresh my report, look at that. Vara's happy now. Do you think you would have ever caught that without Stryker? It would have been pretty hard to find, to be honest. I mean, even looking at a code coverage report would have missed this because that code was being executed, but it wasn't being like fully instrumented. Mm. So I think this is, this is a way to really pinpoint with some precision where like there are parts of your code that maybe aren't being effectively automatically tested. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would call this an unmitigated success myself, Matt. And I think that I think that Arnold would agree. I think we've I think we've gone from a very sad Arnold with very little confidence in what you have done for him to a much happier Arnold, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you agree? Thumbs up. Yeah. I, I can't help but wonder though, Matt. I, I hate to say it, but this Arnold C program is probably not life and death. It's not like you're curing cancer or ending world hunger. Do you have do you have anything that's maybe a little, a little more impactful, a bit more important project, maybe something that involves pizza? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, so, this, so one of the projects that I worked on last year uh, really was deep and personal to me because that it gave me personal pizza um, at the end. <laughs> uh, so one of my hobbies is cycling. Uh, one of the types of bike racing that I like to do are big, long gravel rides um, where you refuel at gas stations. Um, usually Casey's are kind of the S tier version of that. Um, my problem in one of my races was that I was so far behind the main pack that when I would hit up a gas station, all the pizza was already gone because that the folks ahead of me already got those slices. So I had two choices. I could either uh, train my, like train like crazy so that I could get faster to beat them all or solve it with technology. And of course I went with the latter. So what I worked on was I took my GPS tracker that I had on me and I wired it up uh, into uh, the AWS geolocation system. I set up a couple of geofences around strategic points on the course and uh, I set it up so that when I would enter into one of those geofenced areas, it would trigger a Lambda in AWS that would then uh, open up a headless browser, go to Casey's.com and order me a pizza that would be ready for the next place uh, that I, you know, that about an hour down from where my position was. <laughs> so this is just a, a screen capture of that in action. Um, you know, the entire process took like 30 or 45 seconds for it to run. Um, you could specify whether or not you wanted like a Hawaiian pizza or if you wanted something that was a little bit like, you, you know, you could, you can. Yeah, you can <laughs> Excuse <whatever>. me? <laughs> We're not going to solve Shots this problem fired. today. <laughs> But this, but this, and, and so I also set it up so that it would send me a push notification on my watch. Like I was, I was rearing and ready to go. Um, I probably spent way more time on this than I spent actually mm -hmm. training for that bike ride. Um, <laughs> but this, like, this is this is a whole lot more fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the the tools that I use for this, like I said, it was a Lambda script uh, written in TypeScript, um, and it would launch uh, Playwright, which is just a headless browser automation tool. You can actually use Playwright for testing in and of its own self. But in this case, I simply use it to do browser automation because it has some pretty nice uh, APIs to like select different parts mm -hmm. on a page. And I'm sure that since this was such a, a critical key part of your success in this race, like you would go hungry if this failed. I'm sure you have just a ton of tests and that your mutation score is like 95. Boy, you know, we're, we're pretty much out of time now. <laughs> well, the good news is, Matt, I took the liberty of installing Striker on this project as well. Oh, boy. And seeing what your, what your score was like. Would you like to hazard a guess as to how Matt did on his pizza tracking? Any, any guesses? Let, let's just keep that 100% rolling. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, Matt, your score was 2.15. <laughs> What? <laughs> the, 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 this is out of 100, is, by the way. 100 know, like, is the max. I've, I've heard from performance reviews that I have a lot of areas for improvement. So this is, this is nothing new. OK, well, I, I do see you, you, have good, you have good coverage of this dates, this dates class. What's that all about? You're going, what, what dates? Explain. Yeah, so this, this is some code that uh, would detect when the phrase, or when I would, uh, 
uh, when that geofence event was triggered would calculate how far away I was from my next location, uh, the average pace that I was going, and then figure out what time to select from that drop down. Okay, so making sure that you get your pizza at the correct time. Right. That does seem very important. I'm glad that you chose to test that. But Stryker, Stryker might be disappointing us a little bit here, Matt, because it gave you a score of 70 on this file, but three of these lines that it's flagging are console log statements. Do we really need to test console log statements? It's the best debugging tool out there, mm. but uh, <laughs> you probably, yeah, I probably don't care what those test values yeah, are. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. So in this, in this particular scenario, we have a, a much larger project that contains some code that we really don't care about testing. And the good news is Stryker does enable you to say, test this, not that. I don't care about these lines of code. I do care about these lines of code. So let's look a little bit about, like a little bit at how Stryker can do that. So here's our dates class with our lovely console log statements. And with Stryker, all I have to do is add a nice little comment. Stryker disable next line all. And now Stryker says, okay, you don't want to test those log statements. That's fine. And now, Matt, your score is 100, just right. like you wanted on on the dates file. Remember, if we go if we go back here, your your score is 2.17. Hmm. I want I wonder if there are some other console log statements throughout this project. You know, it'd be a real pain to have to go through and find all the console log statements and add these comments to each individual line. I I hope Stryker has a better way to do that. Well, what if what if we add a special thing called an ignorer? Stryker has this concept of an ignorer where you can define what types of expressions and methods you want it to ignore. So in this case, I'm telling it to ignore any, any uh, calls that are done on the console. So with this in place, with this configured, now it will ignore any console log statements and make Matt look slightly better than he did before. Now instead of 316 things that you need to test, now you're down to only 293. Just chip away. We're making progress without even writing any tests. This is amazing. Well, the next thing I notice is that your, your Casey's, your, your actual Casey's code is 153 things that could be tested here. I don't know, do you, is, we just saw a recording of it in action. We can capture the recording, we can play it back, we can see if it's working that way. Do we need to write automated tests around this thing that we have another way to test? Yeah, I mean, other parts of that testing stack may help here. It's probably not the first thing that I would look at. Okay, well, let's, let's ignore it for now. We can always add it back in later. I will update my striker config to ignore Playwright for now. And let's see if this will help us narrow in more on something that is worth testing. Well, I remember, I remember you mentioned those those lambdas, Matt, that's, that's the thing that actually does the work, right? Mm -hmm. Well, those aren't tested at all. Maybe that would be a good thing to test to make sure that the code that is triggering the ordering of the pizza is actually triggering the ordering of the pizza. So let's look at some of the opportunities for testing here. One thing I notice is there's this big long list of args and you have a nice little comment about where you got those. I don't know if I wanna go through the trouble of testing all of those args and writing tests to say this arg exists and that arg exists and these exact args exist. That doesn't sound like the most bang for our buck. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna ignore those as well in my, in my coverage. So if we look at our lambdas file now, we have this lovely striker disable all and then the very important striker restore all because just because you don't want to test part of the file doesn't mean you should test none of the file. I also found in this process that I could not ignore Casey's playwright completely because Lambdas relies on it. So instead I updated uh, this to be uh, disabled instead of uh, completely, completely removed. And this seems similar to the way that you might configure a linting tool like ESLint. Mm -hmm. So now, we have 102 things that we could potentially cover. I think now it's time to finally write a test for our lambdas. Let us test that 
It can take in some details and return a result. Beautiful. Let's test that very basic functionality. Look at that. We're up to 10 killed, 15 survived, and 60 with no coverage. Matt, do you notice anything amiss about this test that I've added? I mean, I see a lot of green, and I hear that testing and getting green is good, right? Mm, <laughs> not in this case, Matt. This is syntax highlighting telling me that I've commented out my expectations. So here's another example where if you were just using code coverage, no one would know. No one would know that you had commented out your expectations. But thanks to Stryker, we said we had all those, we had all those lines that were, that were survived. That's a, big, that's a big hint that something is being executed but not actually tested. So let's uncomment those lines and see if we can get some improvements going. Look at that. 14 killed and down to 11 survived. So we are making progress. Well, this is just a bogus, a bogus event. Let's add something that's a little more realistic. I saw from looking at your code that you're trying to order pizza near Arlington. So as much as you might want just a continuous supply of pizza being ordered, I, I think that that might not be the best for our credit card statement. So I'm gonna write a test to make sure that if you're somewhere other than Arlington, it doesn't order you a pizza. I, I chose that test case first because it's simpler. It's simpler to test that, some, in this case, it's simpler to test that something doesn't happen than to test that something does happen. So with that, uh, we, didn't, we didn't make any changes to our, to our killed count, but it's still a valuable test, I think, to, to make sure that it is taking in this more realistic data. And then finally, we want to get our pizza, so let's have a test case that when we are at Arlington, it will trigger that ordering of the pizza. Now, I don't want to actually order a pizza every time this test runs. That would also not be the best for our, for our bank statement. So there's this concept of mocking, where I create fake versions of that, that playwright file, and it doesn't actually order the pizza, but it verifies that it would order the pizza. So with that in place, our killed count is up to 26. Still have some work to do, but at least now we know that when you're at Arlington, that event will be fired, and when you're not at Arlington, that event will not be fired. You know, given that before we had automated tests around this, the way that I was verifying was setting up a geofence around my house and then physically walking outside and seeing whether or not I would trigger on my phone, this feels like a way faster feedback loop. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Although, I have to admit, you probably get more exercise the other way. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> All right, so this is all well and good. We've, we've talked about lots of different aspects of testing, but it's all been kind of the, the logic-based. What if you have a visual element? We, we chose not to test the visual elements in that, uh, that Casey's example. What if you do have visual elements? Well, one last project that I wanted to share with all of you is granted a, a rather simple application that I wrote a few years ago that is an Angular calculator. So this is written in Angular. It is a very simple calculator app, shows a calculator on your screen. You can press the buttons. All it does is add. That's the only function that I implemented. But I coded this with test-driven development. And I coded it so that the tests actually interact with the UI. It's not just testing the logic. It's actually clicking the buttons and interacting with the UI directly. So you can see lots of references to DOM, uh, button.click, and again, this was written with test-driven development, which means that I wrote the tests hand-in-hand -hand with the code. I didn't write all the code and then go back and try to test it. I wrote a test for a small piece of the functionality and then implemented that piece, and then another test for the next step and implemented that piece. So with that in mind, Matt, would you hazard a guess as how this project's mutation score might compare to some of the other scores we've seen today? You know, I don't think this is a competition. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it might not be a competition, but I think we all know who's winning. <laughs> 87.5. So it's still not perfect. There are some initialization lines that are not tested by the, by the test that I wrote. But, but pretty, pretty good. So test-driven development, that idea of writing your tests and your code hand in hand, that's another example of a tool that you can use to help ensure that your tests are high quality and that they meet all those, all those criteria we talked about. They exist, they pass, 
they actually test what matters, and if something breaks, they're gonna fail. So what do you think, Matt? Are we, are we feeling pretty good about these tools and not just going on vibes anymore? I'm, I, I still am gonna hold vibes close to my heart, but I, I think this is a, probably a more scalable version of that, right? Like this is another tool that you can, that you can pull out to, to see like what parts of your project really don't have good automation around them and where might you get really good value out of focusing on that. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you hazard to say that this is not the case any longer? The resorting to only testing in production? Yeah, I probably need to make some changes to that screen. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so with Stryker, the mutants must die. But I certainly hope that our marriage is going to survive. I think with the right tools in place, we can make it happen. Awesome. <laughs> all right, that's all we've got. Any questions or comments or other tools? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, was there any performance or retest? Yes, and that, boy, I tell you, that, uh, that was the worst part uh, of it. So, so a couple, so I, uh, this is all in preparation for a big, long 30-hour uh, gravel bike race that was happening last summer. And I probably spent the, the previous three months just writing the code for this as opposed to like training. Um, but <laughs> the, way that I was, the way that I would validate that would be to go on shorter rides and set up those geofences and try and you know, end at the Casey's. And every time that I tried that, it would fail. Uh, in fact, the reason that I had tests around those dates uh, files was one of the times that I tried to run it, um, it, was, it tried to uh, navigate or deliver a pizza directly at 12 p.m. at noon. Um, and the JS uh, date functions library that I was using, uh, when I tried to format that, it just decided instead of saying 12 o'clock p.m., which is the drop down option that I needed, it changed it to noon, uh, just to freight the string noon. <laughs> so I, I get there and there's no pizza waiting for me. I'm like, well, this sucks. <laughs> So I was like, you, the lack, and at this point, I didn't have any unit tests at all. So I was like, I can fix this with unit testing. So I got home, took a shower first, and then you know, wrote, wrote up all the code that I had to, to make that function. But that, you know, that, that was a really good indication that, um, uh, in, that my feedback loop of riding 50 miles and then seeing if I got pizza, I could probably shorten that and, <laughs> and put some unit tests around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I literally just went on to Stryker's website and pulled their example. So, great then. yes. <laughs> so I, I don't know if there's. I haven't looked into if there's another way. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I I think it's probably the same for like ESLint rules or anything where you really do need to be parsing an AST. That that's going to take some some knowledge of how like just that an AST exists. And so the ability to like package those up and share those after you've developed and tested those is probably the best way to do that, at least as far as I can see. Okay. The fact that Stryker has those examples that you can just pull down is, is the way to kind of bootstrap a lot of that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Are the mutations just deterministic? Like each time you run it, it's the same mutations or each time it's different mutations? It's the same every, every time. time. Okay. Uh, you can also tell it to disable specific mutations. I didn't do that because it didn't, it didn't seem useful to ignore specific mutations. It seemed more useful to say this chunk of code I don't care as much about testing. And it, it looks like, back to your question, Sandy, I just pulled this up. It looks like they might have some other, some other ways to ignore. Yeah, I don't, remember, I don't remember seeing this when I looked here before, but there it is, ignore method yeah. options. Well, you are looking at the C-sharp version. Oh, drat! That's why I didn't see it before. Silly C-sharp. Okay, well. Oh, well. I, you know, Anders is... <laughs> Look, the, the key language designer for both TypeScript and C-sharp. 
but yeah, same, same mutations every time. You can configure which ones it runs. But in my, my limited experience so far, it doesn't seem like there's a reason to disable them usually. <laughs> That's, yeah, well, yeah, I, I tell you, when I, when I first saw Stryker, I didn't go to X-Men. Uh, I went to Mortal Kombat 2 uh, with Curtis Stryker, and I was looking for that, like, razor blade lined hat. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, a good, good eye. Yeah, see? See? This guy knows. See, I, I didn't get it. <laughs> But that's okay. They, he just, his, his goal is to kill mutants, so, you know. Whoa. Two sides to every coin. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Yeah, I've got the, the striker docs up. As you can see, they have, they have lots of information about how you, set, how you set it up. It's very easy. It's like a three-step process. It's go into your project, run this command to create the config file, run this command to run striker. Um, I did. I can't wait to use it. Yes. I'm about it. Yes. I, I, I was. I was surprised at how mature this project is. Um, you know, I looked a few years back because we we used some of these tools on the Java side at work, um, and we were looking for something that was comparable, and really nothing felt like it was ready for prime time. But these sorts of tools, like it has pretty high. Like you have to use Node 20, I think, as your mm -hmm. as your baseline. Um, but uh, you know, from a from a tooling perspective, you can drop it into basically any modern front end framework. You can run it with Jasmine. You can run it with Jest, VI. Like, it's it's very flexible, and so you know your environment um, can you know can start benefiting from this. I think pretty pretty mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, I I will. My caveat is that these projects are relatively small, so I'd be very curious to hear how it works on a big project. Yeah. Oh boy, oh boy. I, I did try running it on a, I would say a medium sized project at work and I, I got it working, but it, it takes a few minutes to do its thing because it's modifying code in possibly hundreds of ways and running your tests each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's really valuable, but that's just something to keep in mind is that it, it takes a while to run and, um, you know. About what? Oh, yeah, it does, it does have some parallelization, but in my l very limited experience, it, it, still, it, it still can be slow, even with that in place. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, dependent on like, your version control? Is it making those changes and then reverting quickly? Does it matter what version control you're using? Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, as, I, as near I, as I can tell, it's, it's just making changes while it's running and then reverting them all. Yeah, I never saw VCS complaining. I think it might make the changes in memory um, before it runs, but it doesn't. It doesn't expect that you have like a Git repo on it or anything. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I will say if anyone does use this, like I'd love to hear about it because I'm, I'm, I'm a novice at this myself. Yeah. So. This looks really awesome, and uh, I want to apologize to everyone. We have a, a strict, like, no, you're not up here to pitch things type thing. You're not up here to pitch your, your project, and this is the best pitch I've seen for the Tech Talkers <laughs> group, so uh, I apologize. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, that was great, and uh, I, I can't wait to try this out, too. This is awesome. I didn't even know tools like this existed, so mm -hmm. yeah, can't wait. Cool. Thank you cool. so much Thanks, for speaking. Thanks. Thanks. Is there stuff that exists like this for other languages, like YAML files? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think the, the I think the the best fix for YAML is HCL uh, or another not YAML <laughs> language. Uh, but yeah, but uh, but there are there are tools like this for other uh, for other languages. Like if you're in the Java ecosystem, uh, PI test is kind of the the gold standard for that. Um, we act we've had quite a few debates at work as to whether or not, if we are going to put an enforcement metric on it, is code coverage or mutation coverage going to be a better mutation. value? Um, I, yeah, we're, we're on one side of the, on that debate. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to offer one, one, you're reminding me of the value of one of the tips that really helped me a lot, that thing, which is uh, Gary Bernhardt saying, always 
what's what's your expectation when you're running the tests? If you've never seen the test fail, you don't know it works. Mm -hmm. and you can do that while you're running the test. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think that's one of the those magical things about test-driven uh, development is you like if you are in that red green refactor cycle then you always are going to see that because that you're going to write a test and it's going to fail because it doesn't parse correctly or because of the expectation isn't there. And you're only adding just, like, just from sheer developer laziness, uh, you know, you're, not, you're only writing the extra amount of production code that actually will get your test to pass. So it just kind of naturally gravitates toward those, those good to high metrics. Thanks a lot, folks. Yeah, thanks. Looks like we got two.